Russia says it's suspending the last remaining nuclear treaty with the United States. The new START deal limits the number of nuclear warheads the two superpowers can deploy. So what does this mean? And could it trigger an arms race? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the programme. I'm Nick Clark. Now, Russian President Vladimir Putin says his country is suspending its role in the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, or START. He made the announcement on Tuesday at a speech ahead of the first anniversary of the start of the war in Ukraine. Now, START limits the strategic nuclear arms arsenals of both Russia and the United States. Putin said Russia was not completely withdrawing from the treaty, but it is due to lapse in 2026, and that will remove the last constraint on the arsenals of the world's two major nuclear powers. Harry Fawcett explains the history of the new start. The Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, first signed by Presidents Bush and Gorbachev in 1991, has been part of the nuclear weapons framework in some form ever since. Barack Obama and Dmitry Medvedev inaugurated its successor, New Start, in 2010. Under its terms, Russia and the United States, owners of 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, would limit their deployed strategic warheads to 1,550 and their long-range missiles and bombers to 700. Each side could inspect the other's sites to ensure compliance up to 18 times a year. But inspections were halted, first by COVID-19 and then by deteriorating relations since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. On Tuesday in Moscow, Vladimir Putin announced Russia was suspending its membership, he said, in response to hostile U.S. actions. And now they want to inspect our defense objects. In the current condition of confrontation that takes place today, it sounds like nonsense. U.S.-Russia relations on nuclear weapons have been strained for years. The United States pulled out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty in 2002 and left the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty in 2019, accusing Russia of developing a cruise missile that breached its terms. Experts fear a breakdown of the architecture that for decades has reined in nuclear arsenals. We seem to be losing the last bilateral relationship governing nuclear weapons, so we could have an arms race after this. And that arms race has not existed because of this agreement, because of the inspections that back up the intelligence that uh, both states have. And so you have one of those pillars being taken away. Joe Biden agreed a five-year extension to New Start when he took office in 2021. Vladimir Putin emphasized his action was a suspension, not a withdrawal, but has raised the prospect of the treaty lapsing in 2026. He also said he had put new nuclear systems on combat duty and pledged to resume nuclear testing if the United States did the same. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera. For more on this now, I'm joined by our guest in Alexandria in Virginia is Donald Jensen, a Russia director at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He's also a former U.S. diplomat in Moscow and a former Soviet weapons inspector. In Pakistan, in Lahore, is Rabia Akhtar, a director of the Center for Security, Strategy and Policy Research at the University of Lahore. And uh, Rabia specializes in nuclear security and deterrence. And finally, in Moscow, is Dmitry Babich, who's a political commentator for Russia Sigodnia, a news agency owned and operated by the Russian government. Uh, welcome to you all. Good to have you here for this important discussion. Uh, Donald, I'd like to start with you first, if I may. Before we get into what all this means and what the implications are, can we first just try and understand how important the treaty is, what function it has had, and how it has been keeping things in check? Well, first of all, it's, it's both important as a technical agreement, it's important as a political agreement. It's the last main pillar of the very important security architecture that Russia, the Soviet Union, and the United States developed during the Cold War. I was involved in negotiations. It was painstakingly detailed. And I personally think that it's very important that this treaty remain in place. Uh, but, however, uh, it depends on trust. And when that trust involves allowing on-site inspections, that trust allows, uh, that trust involves uh, data exchanges, matters like that. 
So while President Reagan said trust but verify, you can verify only with technical exchanges and on-site inspections. So if this treaty goes or is shaken or is weakened, then I think we're in a way back to early Cold War where the entire security architecture for strategic stability is gone. Okay. So this is a very, very important thing. Uh, both sides, I think, need to be careful. Both sides, I think, at the end of the day, want a renewal or adaptation. But to some extent, it's caught up in the tensions between the two countries okay. that are going on and right we'll, now. We'll get into that. Now, Rabia, uh, so each side could inspect each other's sites. Uh, so that enabled and, and prevented things from spiraling. And now, I guess it's harder to monitor the compliance. And that's the issue, is it? Yes. Uh, so under this agreement, uh, uh, in verification and inspection of each other's site was a very important part of it. And now what basically the U.S. gets to lose in all of this is uh, through their national technical means on ground inspections. And then they would not know as to what's going on uh, with various developments that Russia is planning going ahead. Uh, but also under this agreement, you know, both sides had committed to deploying no more than uh, 1550 strategic nuclear warheads and a maximum of 700 long-range missiles and bombers. And the good thing is that even though Russia has suspended, it has not completely withdrawn from the treaty and will still oblige uh, by the treaty obligations. Right. And that's the point, isn't it, Dmitry Babich? Uh, because they, they haven't pulled out, they have suspended, but potentially, we've got this whole renewal process coming up in four years' time. Uh, if relations do not improve, we have, could have a situation where the whole international arms control regime has, has all but collapsed because we've already had uh, other agreements that have gone in the Trump era. Uh, you are absolutely right about the extension in uh, four years. Let me remind you that uh, Trump uh, was uh, toying with the idea of not uh, extending this treaty uh, in the beginning of 2021. Mm -hmm. So it was a sigh of relief in Moscow when uh, uh, President Biden extended it. Uh, however, uh, also let me remind you that uh, initially it was Russia who insisted uh, on this uh, limit uh, to the number of warheads, because unlike the United States, which can or which could uh, increase the number of its warheads uh, or keep them operational. Uh, Russia was tight uh, on money. You know, we didn't have the resources uh, to produce more warheads, uh, and it was pretty costly to uh, to maintain uh, the level of 1,500 agreed in this treaty. So basically, it was Russia who pushed for more, uh, like transparency, for more reductions. And uh, President George Bush, the junior, was very reluctant uh, initially to uh, make it a detailed agreement. He just said, uh, if you remember, uh, we are no longer enemies, the Cold War is over, let's not go into details, let's not make any obligations. Mm -hmm. It was Russia who insisted that there should be inspections and that should be a very or pretty detailed document. Let me remind you that uh, the real reduction treaties of the 70s, they were thick books, you know, which uh, detailed everything. Uh, yeah, OK. But so so now, now we're at the point where, where compliance is going to be very hard to monitor. Uh, and so, Dmitry, just briefly, if you would, if we, you know, Vladimir Putin has said that he will stick to the limits of 1,500 nuclear weapons. I'm just wondering, why does that even matter? Because 1,500 nuclear weapons is enough to send us all sky high anyway, isn't it? Uh, well, uh, I think... Uh, Putin mentioned it in his speech. Little by little, the countries like uh, uh, the UK, France, and uh, even China, uh, they are uh, becoming important nuclear powers. I mean, they ha always had uh, their own capability, but it was incomparable uh, to the nuclear arsenals of uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the United States. Now it's starting to change. And obviously, in his speech, Putin insisted that France and uh, Britain, their potential should be also included because they revealed themselves to be very hostile to Russia in the last eight years since uh, the legally elected government was mm. ousted by the so-called revolution in Ukraine. So this is the logic of Putin, I, I guess. Okay.
So, what about you, Rabia? What's, what's your thinking about it? What's your thinking of uh, Vladimir Putin's motivation behind this? He's been boxed into a corner, so he's laying out his cards. So I believe that, you know, there are 50 plus countries who have come together to address uh, Ukraine's military needs with additional air defenses and armored vehicles. And now tanks are being added. But which one of them is talking about a diplomatic solution? None of them. You know, so all of these uh, countries led by the U.S. and NATO have been dismissive of Russia's security concerns. And here I am, like, sitting in Pakistan thinking that what if this was Pakistan's backyard in Afghanistan and India had done the same thing, you know, putting uh, missiles in Afghanistan, giving umbrella to Afghanistan? What would have happened then? Uh, so Russia is definitely threatened and pushed into a corner. And uh, this is just signaling. Uh, this is just telling the United States that is any city in U.S. worth risking Ukraine over. Uh, so I think it is a time to contemplate. It is part of Russia's signaling. Uh, and the reason that they are not withdrawing and just using suspension is also buying time. Uh, they're doing ICBM testing. Uh, U.S. has done ICBM testing. And uh, both of them are just, you know, trying to send each other signals that we are going to be arsenal ready if it comes to that. Uh, but it all is part of uh, broader signaling to each other and, and power showing. Uh, but I think Russia definitely is cornered and uh, will use every, uh, you know, card in its playbook in order to uh, not be the one to go down first. Right. Donald Jensen, no one is talking about a diplomatic solution. Russia is... is has been pushed into a corner. Do you think the West has gone too far in arming Ukraine? There's talk of supplying F-16s. Well, there's talk about supplying F-16s. However, they're not supplying F-16s. The U.S. has made it quite clear there are limits to its support for Ukraine in the sense only that they do not want any of attacks on Russia. I don't think Russia is in a corner. I don't think the U.S. has pushed too far. I think that this is actually basically a unifying uh, Western response to a war of Russian uh, uh, invasion of, of Ukraine, which is a violation of international law. But if I could go back to, I believe, Dimitri's point, I think that uh, it's a key moment for start architecture for a number of reasons. Number one is the fact that theoretically, I don't think it will happen, but theoretically, both sides could deploy and develop more strategic nuclear weapons. However, as Dimitri said, uh, the Chinese in particular appear to be building up their nuclear forces. The START treaty does not take that into account at all. So any revised treaty probably would be best served by having the Chinese as participants. So far, they're not that interested. The second phenomenon would be the development of new weapon systems. The ability of conventional weapons to inflict massive destruction is higher than ever before. There's space weapons, cyber. There are uh, hypervelocity weapons, which the Kremlin has bragged about, which are not nuclear necessarily. All those new systems are coming online at a time when START is under attack. So both sides, all sides, have to think through the strategic calculus right now. It's a good time for it. And it's unfortunate that the war has gotten uh, uh, where we saw yesterday with the Russians suspending their participation. Well, there is certainly now an opportunity to rethink the whole uh, concept of a non-proliferation. Uh, the John Bolton, who served as national security advisor during the Trump administration, he he said that he viewed New Start as a bad deal, didn't he? And said that if it disappeared tomorrow, it wouldn't trouble me at all. And he pointed to, to what you just mentioned that China should be the main concern, and they should be brought into the fold. And possibly we should bring you know others into the fold as well at that point in time, Rabia, maybe India as well. You're right. Uh, you know, perhaps it is for the better that the global nuclear arms control architecture undergoes a revision. And the top three, United States, China and Russia, now need to sit down and probably chart out something. Uh, uh, what my fellow panelists alluded to earlier about emerging technologies, a new set of weaponry that is coming into play, there is no strategic arms control to address those. Uh, so I guess the time is opportune right now. And yes, nobody gets to lose anything. Russia, I believe, is not unilaterally responsible for the breakdown of the arms control architecture today. 
Uh, it was George Bush in 2002 who unilaterally withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And then it was uh, President Trump who unilaterally withdrew U.S. from the INF treaty. And at that time, too, United States was pointing fingers at Russia and Russia pointing fingers at the U.S. that both were uh, violating the terms of the treaty. And Russia said that if U.S. can make armed drones that were equal into ground-launched cruise missiles, then why should they adhere to the treaty stipulations anyway? So I think with this new uh, emerging technologies and new weapon systems, uh, new architecture needs to come in place, and perhaps this is the right time for that. Dmitry Babich, is this about getting President Biden to approach Russia uh, to start negotiations to try and end the war? Is, is that what Vladimir Putin is trying to do? Is, is that how he's playing his cards? Uh, well, I think nuclear weapons uh, is a too important issue uh, by itself, you know. Uh, however, I agree with uh, Rabia that, of course, it was not Putin who uh, destroyed the system of arms control. Uh, she rightly mentioned ABM treaty scrapped by the United States, INF treaty scrapped by the United States. Let me also remind you uh, of the Conventional Forces in Europe treaty. Uh, Donald is right. Uh, conventional weapons are becoming very destructive. And unfortunately, it was the West uh, that uh, just refused to review this treaty. Uh, according to the old treaty signed in 1990, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia are still under Soviet control, Russian control. And uh, of course, uh, Russia was right to, to require the review of that treaty, which is now dead, uh, actually. Uh, however, uh, I agree with you that, uh, of course, Russia would like some kind of negotiation on Ukraine with the United States because uh, the Ukrainian government under Mr. Zelensky, look, uh, they have been unable to produce any uh, tangible agreements. The trust between us is almost zero, especially after Ukraine went out of uh, peace negotiations last year in March. Uh, so uh, Russia would like negotiations with the United States on Ukraine. Uh, but I don't think in these negotiations uh, nuclear arms will be one of their bargaining chips. That's too important. That will be set aside and decided separately, I hope. Right. Well, it seems that the nuclear treaties, uh, or certainly this one, the START treaty, is, is a bargaining chip. But Rabia, what, what does a world without a START treaty look like? If we come up to four years' time and then one isn't negotiated, that the relations are still too poor, uh, and then everybody's at it, are we looking at an arms race? We already are in an arms race. Like I said, that you know, with emerging technologies, with hypersonic weapons, and the whole list that has been just uh, put forward, uh, we already the world is already in an arms race situation. And countries like India and Pakistan, India uh, and Pakistan are caught up in a strategic chain with China. And and anything that India does to modernize its forces. You know, it says it is doing because you, China is doing it, and China says it is doing because U.S. is doing it. And Pakistan, being at the strategic at the end of the strategic chain, is is suffering because of the nuclear arms race that's been spiraling out of control. So I don't think so in four years' time if we don't have new start uh, or something that looks like or both countries getting back together, we have much to lose. The architecture, the order that was in place, that was the golden period of arms control during the Cold War is long dead and gone. Uh, it is time that if the strategic competition between United States, China, and Russia uh, needs to be settled, a new arms race, race architecture needs to be brought about, which is only going to benefit countries like India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. Uh, Donald Jensen, is interesting, isn't it? I'd like to respond to that, but it's interesting, isn't it, because it wasn't that long ago, was it, that President Obama was, was talking about world powers working towards a world without nuclear weapons at all. It, it shows how quickly things can collapse. That was always sort of an idealistic uh, and unrealistic mm -hmm. uh, aspiration. You remember back in the 80s, uh, Gorbachev and Reagan uh, uh, talked about the same thing. So I have to, we have to be realistic, and one of the things you have to re be realistic about are the categories, the weapons levels that this treaty has. These weapons are expensive. They take many years to get online. And the 1550 and 700, 800 for launchers is an acceptable framework from within which to work. Uh, I would, by the way, disagree with the uh, narrative about the U.S. Uh, noncompliance, but 
Uh, let's not get into that. Uh, the problem is that we are at a turning point, as uh, my two counterparts said, and we need to be very serious about where we go, where we go next. Uh, uh, one of the interesting dramas we've seen is that some people have tried to keep the strategic discussion away from the war in Ukraine. I think that personally, I think that would be useful, but we've not been able to completely do that. And as we saw yesterday, uh, both crises are now uh, tied together. We need to separate those and make progress on strategic arms stability, uh, not reduction necessarily, but stability as best we can going forward now. And that's why the, the two or three years we have left after the START extension uh, is very, very important. What do we want? What do the Russians want? What do the Chinese want? How can we create a balance mm -hmm. in all these nuclear powers, taking into account new systems? That's a key strategic challenge. That takes time, and I'm worried that we're running out of time. Uh, Dmitry Babich, let's bring it back to the Ukraine war, uh, the war in Ukraine itself, on Russia suspending the treaty. When Russia's foreign minister says the United States must make a conscientious effort to de-escalate and create conditions for full functioning of the treaty, what does that mean? Leave Ukraine alone? Uh, no, uh, just to limit, at least limit the aspirations of, of the government in Kiev. Uh, let me remind you that just recently the Ukrainian president, uh, uh, Zelensky, he said that uh, Ukraine was going to reconquer Crimea. And obviously the Russian leadership is taking this seriously. You know, there are fortification works now starting in Crimea to protect it from a possible invasion. Uh, let me remind you that Crimea has been a, a, a part of Russia for eight years now. There are two million people living there. I will not go into history. It was always a part of the uh, Russian Empire since the uh, late 18th century, as old as the United States. But of course, it would be a tragedy if, uh, if uh, Ukraine tries to take uh, Crimea back. So that talk, uh, the irresponsible talk of people like Victoria Nuland about possible strikes against Crimea, that should uh, stop uh, and uh, that would ease the situation, uh, including, of course, uh, the possible use of uh, some destructive weapons. Not necessarily weapons of mass destruction, but just uh, uh, when uh, all 27 countries uh, of the European Union and all 30 countries of NATO talk about the need of Russia's defeat and when they send weapons, of course, that makes people in Moscow nervous and angry. Uh, and uh, this situation should be de-escalated. I think this is uh, what Moscow wants and what Kiev should want if, if it cared about its population okay. and about its country. Rabia, how much of a tightrope do you think the world is walking right now because of this and, and the corner that Vladimir Putin uh, finds himself in and, and may well find himself in as time goes on if, if things go against uh, the Russian offensive? I think it is a dangerous time, uh, not only for the world, uh, but specifically for the region itself. Uh, all Russia wants, I believe, is uh, to maintain global strategic parity. And it wants, and it keeps making references to a global world order, which is a rules-based world order, but not only the rules that the U.S. wants the rest of the world to follow, but in which Russia and China also have a say. And this strategic competition uh, that U.S. is involved in with respect to China on one hand and with respect to Russia on the other hand uh, does not serve the purpose because uh, and all the things that U.S. is doing to modernize its forces, both nuclear and conventional, you, have, uh, you must have seen the nuclear posture reviews that have come out in uh, 2018 and 2022 uh, are escalatory and offensive in nature. It talk, they talk about uh, making weapon, smaller, you know, usable uh, nuclear weapons uh, that are low yield in nature, which means that they are battlefield usable. So the world is inching to, towards destruction uh, with more emerging technologies and uh, more set of new weaponry added onto it with no arms control talk happening anywhere. Uh, so it is a dangerous time for all of us uh, to think about it as to whether deterrence and going in a uh, you know digital age and in hypersonic age, in the age of AI, is it going to be sustainable in coming years to come?
Uh, Donald Jensen, would you like to re respond to that? And also, from your point of view, is the world a less safe place right now? I believe, yes, the world is a less safe place. But to some extent, that's uh, also uh, the fault of China and Russia. Uh, China and Russia are directly challenging the rules-based international order. Uh, the buildup of strategic nuclear forces, for example, by the Chinese has gone on for 20 years. The, the report that my counterpart talked about is really a relatively late U.S. response to modernization uh, of uh, both the Russian and Chinese nuclear forces. Uh, uh, I think it is a dangerous time. I think it's everybody should start thinking about how to manage these very serious challenges that the three of us are talking about today. And I think there are way, ways to do that. Uh, on Ukraine, of course, we're back to the, uh, the Russian uh, narrative, which is simply wrong. Crimea is not part of Russia. It's not part of Russia by international law. And uh, uh, Russia, for example, in the 90s, was a part of the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed Ukraine security. What we have, however, is a brutal, violent war against a, uh, uh, a dem democracy, frankly, which uh, Russia tries to justify unsuccessfully with various rationales that nobody, nobody really believes. So, as I said, as my partners have said, uh, it's a dangerous moment. Is it more dangerous today than yesterday? Probably yes. But I think the very interesting comments from Putin and today by Russian officials that they are not going to go ahead and violate the start limits uh, quickly or with regard to nuclear testing show that both uh, Russia and I think the United States want to move forward with a follow on start, either as a revision to the current agreement or as a new agreement, taking into account the factors that all of us all have right. talked about here this morning. All right, Donald, thanks for that, uh, Donald Jensen there. Uh, everybody, thanks very much indeed. We've run out of time. Do appreciate your time. Donald Jensen, Rabbi Hakta, and Dmitry Babich, thanks so much for this uh, important and interesting and illuminating discussion. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again at any time by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Nick Clark, and the whole team here, it's goodbye for now.